I'm, I'm talking about work that's, um, that's barely out of the field, um, which is very new for me, because normally by the time I write a paper or present anything, it's been a couple of years of data being out of the field. We're so backlogged. But um, this work was um, finished. Uh, the, 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 the impact evaluation I'm going to talk about was literally done and completed by September, almost by mid-October. So some of the results are really new. And I'd love input, and um, they may also, you know, some sort of they we, we haven't done some parts of it yet, but I think we have enough here. Um, so maybe I can. Okay, so the title is also somewhat tentative. Um, it's something I came up with just uh, I think day before yesterday, um, <laughs> as I was writing the presentation, which I wrote day before yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, so it should be fun. Um, okay. So the idea. Let me let me. This work is actually joined with a PhD student. Um, at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, she was working with us um, on very early parts of the of the of the IE that underlies this one uh, before she became a PhD student, and this is also feeding into her dissertation. So I'm very happy about that. Um, okay, so um, basically, um, there's the this 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 paper really looks at the role of social networks in leveraging uh, behavior change. Um, uh, uh, right, and there's a quite a bit of literature um, on the importance of peer effects um, on influencing a rather diverse set of individual choices. There's work on investment, on saving, on technology adoption, um, and 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 there's also a, quite a bit of work that such networks can facilitate, um, particularly the take up of health technologies. Right, you think of the uh, of the paper, the deworming paper, uh, bed nets. Uh, menstrual cups, right? However, in all of this literature, the role attributed to peer networks is one of information diffusion, right? And learning, but it's not, but I, I think there's very little on, on, on actually using the peer group itself to, to motivate change, right? Uh, much of that literature is actually coming from lab experiments on contributions to public goods games, which has shown us that social networks can actually be powerful uh, catalysts for, uh, for inducing socially desirable behavior, right? And that may be because they trigger image motivation, um, uh, leadership, uh, the desire to seek approval, and so forth. Um, now, it, the, 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 the use of these sorts of mechanisms, though, has not been tested empirically, um, particularly in the case of health despite the fact that there's been incredibly low take up in developing countries of preventive care products, right? Um, so what this paper does, and this is really part of a larger project, so what I'm going to report to you, uh, and as I go, I'll explain, the chapter will kind of pull from some of this, but you'll see that as we go. But the overall project, I should say, assesses the impact of using peer groups, in this case, case village-based community organizations, and I'll describe how these were formed, to introduce and encourage the uptake of a particular preventive healthcare product. Um, and we do this through a series of what could be called framed field experiments. They're done in the field with large groups of people. Um, all right. So the quick roadmap of the talk is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the motivation for doing this uh, and why the particular product that we chose was selected. Um, and then describe the IEs on which this builds. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about, since it's a product, it's a healthcare product, we need to worry about the willingness to pay for the product. So I'll talk a little bit about how we elicit that and, and as well as elicit the social norm around willingness to pay because this ends up being important. All right, let's give you some early results. All right, so the, the product we focus on is actually point of use water treatment. And why water? Well, <laughs> uh, so. During an IE, we were already running. At the midline of that IE, we ran water tests in, in the population that we were, we were studying. And we found that basically over two thirds of the water was E. coli contaminated. Um, about a third of it was actually contaminated at source, right? Which means this was coming out of hand pumps. This is not pipe water supply. This is coming directly out of hand pumps and mechanized pumps. Right? which ostensibly are going into the aquifer, and yet this water was e contaminated, a third of it is contaminated at source. Um, 
it, uh, about 68% gets contaminated by the time it is put into storage devices. Yeah? Um, and as well, 55% of water collected from community water schemes was also contaminated. Um, and the rates vary. Yeah? In some cases, as much as 50% of the water is contaminated at source. These are areas which are mainly places where hand pumps are used. They go a little bit less deep into the soil. So the, uh, this project is also partly, um, I'm, 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 I'm involved in a larger project that looks at the overall impact of water, um, uh, water and sanitation infrastructure on, on health outcomes. And, and so this, this also feeds into that. But given these astonishingly high rates of contamination, um, you know, and we know that basically these are, uh, the, these contribute to diarrheal disease um, and, and, and through diarrhea to child stunting. Uh, but also in addition to diarrhea, there's a lot of worry now about environmental enter enteropathy basically also contributing to, study, uh, to stunting. So what's going on is you have E. coli contaminated water, particularly at very young ages, and that actually permanently destroys the intestinal villi so that you cannot absorb nutrients, right? So you may recover from the diarrhea episode and all of that, but it's still going to affect growth because you're, 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 you're and this is permanent, it's not reversible, yeah? So, okay, most dangerous for the young ones. Okay, uh, Pakistan actually has extraordinarily high stunting rates, 43% in 2011, and there has been no improvement uh, in the last 14 or 15 years. It's among the countries with the highest rates. Diarrhea rates of 23% in 2012, again, no improvement in diarrhea. This is important because this is happening in a background where, in fact, access has become near universal, right? So everybody has access to water at their doorstep. Most people have privately, and at least in rural areas, where there's very little public provision, but almost everyone has a hand pump or a mechanized pump in their home. So it's not like they're walking far away to get water or getting water from uncertain sources. Uh, there's been a massive expansion in, in household toilet access, stunting, uh, I'm sorry, uh, open defecation rates have fallen dramatically, and yet there's been absolutely no improvement in any of the things we routinely ex expect to happen with expansion of water and sanitation services. Simultaneously, poverty has also declined dramatically, so all the usual causes that we would look for don't seem to, uh, to play out. Uh, I have a theory about that, which, I'm, which, which is part of the larger work, but I won't go into that here yet, because we have a lot to get through. So, um, so why point of view? So, as I said, nearly 99% of households do not treat their water in any way. Uh, however, most have water within their homes. So we cannot do community level uh, treatment of water. It's not possible if you have, most people have their individual hand pumps and motorized pumps from which they draw water 24 hours a day as they need it. Um, and we use basically the product that we're going to focus on is, is chlorine. Um, for many reasons, it's locally sourced, it's extremely cheap. Uh, it was basically we calculated uh, rupees 240 per month for a household of 10 to provide all of their drinking water needs plus drinking water, cooking, and some other needs. Yeah? Uh, and this is at market price, right? So uh, actually, if you buy in bulk, you can actually reduce that price quite a bit. Uh, but there would have been no problem with, with availability. Currently, though, in our villages, there is no market for chlorine. So it's not like there are competing sources of chlorine. It's important to keep in mind. Part of the, part of the effort in this project was to figure out if we could get uh, enough uptake and sort of encourage a market uh, so that local, local suppliers would start keeping chlorine um, in stores. Okay, so the main questions we want to test is whether community organizations can be used to build demand for point of use water treatment um, and, 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 and then basically to focus on which types of motivation triggers could be used in the context of community organizations to encourage uh, uptake. And we test three that I'll describe, image leadership and giving subsidies. Um, and then of course we're interested given the focus on gender in particular here is whether women respond differently in villages that got this inclusion treatment that I will describe in a minute and whether leaders of community organizations as natural leaders act in a more pro-social pro manner and I will describe who these leaders are um, next okay 
So uh, this, this work builds on an underlying, I need to explain this so you get some of the results. This work builds on an underlying impact evaluation, a randomized impact evaluation that we started in 2010 and ended in 2016 at Endline. Um, the, under this intervention, community groups were created um, and the objective was to deepen inclusion, which is the, the, ha the uh, requirement was that at least 50% of households will be organized into community organizations. So in a sense, uh, we have a lot of community organizations per village and that's important. So the results are much more generalizable in that sense. Um, the social groups include women only, men only, and mixed gender. Uh, they were required to cover 50% uh, I said of the village population, but the important thing was that above these groups is a village level organization. So they were aggregating up to a village level organization and this is where the leaders of each community organization would filter into the, into the VO. The VO had to decide on a village fund that was quite large, $30,000 per village plus 20% of community contribution. That's pretty large given the ordinary domain of community development projects. Um, uh, and, and this village organization was required to create a village development plan. Um, there are several papers we are working on from this project. But the important thing for us is, one, the existence of these organizations as a base as we go in. And the second is the fact that as part of the effort to improve governance in the CDD project, inclusion mandates were put on women and poor households. So unlike in other countries, in Pakistan, uh, community organizations were not women-centered at all. Uh, they really targeted men for the most part. And this was a concern we had, we had voiced before we started the impact evaluation, and the program actually was changed to require that at least 40% of all community organization members and all village organization members have to be women, and 50% and have to be from poor households. Um, the, and the second kind of intervention was that the VDP, the Village Development Plan, had to be subject to secret ballot ratification. I don't worry so much about the, this. I'm going to focus more mainly on the inclusion for, for our purposes. So this motivation IE that I'm going to describe was actually implemented, as I said, July to September 2016, after the end line on the underlying IE was done. So we have finished and out, and then, then, and then we did this IE. So it kind of randomizes, re-randomizes on top of the, and I'll describe how. So basically, this has two components. Um, we, we gave, in some villages, this is a village-wide uh, intervention, was to give an, what I'm calling an externality treatment which is that an information message was, an information campaign was really done in every village, uh, delivered at CO meetings. Um, this was, of course, a campaign designed for a low literacy context. The campaign focused on village water contamination levels, which we had, because we had collected water contamination data for each village, um, on the key health behaviors uh, to keep water safe, and particularly prevent recontamination, uh, the use of chlorine, and then we did water tasting, so everybody could be assured that the taste of water wasn't going to be bad if you mix the right amount of chlorine with the right amount of water. Um, and then we gave them each a canister that was of the right size. The key difference between the externalities and no externalities treatment was that in the externalities treatment, uh, meeting members were also told that their own actions would affect the health of others in their community and in their village. Yeah. Um, Underneath each of these, we run, we try three different motivational approaches to try to elicit uh, uptake of, of this product, right? And, and these are um, done within village CO level. So, so we have lots of variation, and I will describe each of these three to you, uh, and then go to the results. So, uh, so the image uh, motivation, basically, uh, is recognizes the fact that individuals are affected by the perceptions of others. They try to actually, uh, in, particularly in public, may want to mimic how, what others do, particularly people who are within their social reference group, right? And this may be tied to how visible the action is, right? So, um, uh, in, in the first, so, so the way we designed this to kind of elicit this was what we're interested in is understanding whether if we can make actions public, right? do more people, are more people willing to, to purchase the product, right? So it's sort of more, are people more interested in status seeking behavior, um, right? Um, and if we allow people to self-select into public bidding, right? 
uh, does that increase in a further increase willingness to pay right so people who actually choose to be public to have their actions be public may be more inclined to then engage in more pro-social pro behavior so the three arms are basically private bidders are told that their bids will not be revealed to anyone yeah you can bid in private and i'll explain the bidding mechanism public bids are people who are told that whatever bid they place will be revealed to everyone at the end of the bidding process and then there is a third group in which people can self-select into bidding yeah i'm going to be describing a lot of stuff so this might uh, yeah. <laughs> um I'm, I'm i'm sorry you can't ask questions along the way but uh, in any case um, i'm happy to take everything at the end um so in the second game which is a leadership game we have two arms um we either uh, in the first arm we randomize people to leadership right so uh, you meet and some people are assigned to be random leaders others to random followers right and 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 um for randomized first movers their bids are by definition public because then you want to elicit whether whether they make bids that that, uh, that are higher and then followers uh, are free to choose to place their bids relative to what what the randomized leader has done in the other arm people can self select into leadership right they can choose whether they want to be leaders or not and underneath of course as i told you there are natural leaders right so there are VO members who are part of these meetings, and they, they can be seen as natural leaders since they're already leaders within their village, and we want to know whether natural leaders behave differently than randomized leaders, yeah? Okay, so now the third one is the subsidy one. Here, basically, we, in the first time, we randomize a group of people to sharing. You can either choose to, sh you're given a subsidy, you can either share that subsidy or not, right? You're free not to share. You're ma it's made very clear to you that you can share zero or share some positive amount, but you are randomized into sharing. And in the second arm, people can self-select into sharing, right? So they can choose whether they want to uh, they want to share or not. Um, and again, um, you know, subsidies can be a useful kind of a mechanism uh, for encouraging, particularly purchase of products that are unknown or new. Right? So you want to subsidize purchase, but then you want ideally to give those subsidies in an environment where, there is, where, where they encourage the most take up, right? Because they're costly. All right, so we want to elicit willingness to pay clearly in this game because we want to understand how people uh, exactly choose, you know, whether there, is, there, whether there is uptake of the product. So we do this in two ways. In the, in the image and leadership um, uh, experiments, we are basically going to use what the BDM auction, which is a very, which is, you know, simple. It's basically uh, people state their reservation price. So I'm giving you a domain of the price first. The market price for this product was about 240 for a family, fairly large family. Uh, the price we offer during this entire process is between 50 and I think it's 50 to 150. Is it 50 or 60? 60 to 150. Yeah. And that's because we got the product at a subsidy, and, and this product could be available to everyone at a subsidy, actually, given re re reasonably bulk pur pur purchase. So we think that's a good domain of price to keep. Um, so basically, what people are asked to do is to state their reservation price, any, any number between 10 and 150 in increments of 10 rupees, right? Then a price is drawn by a lottery, if the price is that's drawn is less than them, their willingness to pay, then they have to purchase the product. If it's greater, then they cannot purchase the product. Because of the way the BDM lottery set, auction is set up, you, your, your, best, uh, your best sort of option is to, in fact, state your maximum willingness to pay. Because if you understate it, you may not be able to get the product if you, in fact, want it. Um, in the subsidy case, because we already have to explain the subsidy, and this is a very low literacy environment, so we, we basically go with a take it or leave it, a TOLE offer, which is, you know, a, 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 a lottery price is drawn. You either can choose to purchase or not, right? And the subsidy in this case, and the subsidy game was fixed at 40 uh, rupees. Okay. Um, the one thing we do want to understand is how social norms can influence uh, the decision to, to, to purchase or not. So we ask everyone at the beginning, we explain before we assign people, to their games, and this is important. We ask people uh, in private, they take a small survey, um, and then we ask them whether, um, what do they think is the willingness to pay of others in their community, right? Within this price range 
from 60 to 150, right? Um, and, 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 and so using this, this so, sort of this social norm on, on, on what, remember this is an unknown product and you're quite worried that for unknown products, this, this may be low anyway, and, it may, and, that, and this could rise over time, right? If you're introducing a new product. So we're really getting the first sort of baseline on this. What do people think people will pay for this product now when a new product is being introduced and you've just been told that your water is contaminated? So using this, we can create a variable, which I'll use in a minute, uh, which is the deviation from this norm, right? Which says how far is the individual's bid from the, the, what they said was the norm, right? What they thought was the norm for the community, right? Uh, and so we get a sense of the conformity, uh, the degree of conformity to the social norm that individuals exercise uh, in their bidding, right? And we can, very, we can look at this by whether they are, they are, they are in the public or the private and so forth. All right, um, so we know essentially uh, uh, that in the image case, if individuals are mainly status seeking, their, their bids will be higher in public. Uh, if they're very worried about uh, norms and conformity, then the dev norm should actually incre decrease in public, yeah? All right, so, so let's look at, uh, I'm gonna give you the first set of results and um, I'm gonna try and tie them all together. Uh, it's still very early days, but I think some of these results are quite interesting. So in the, random, in the public bidding game, if you look at the average impact, of public bidding, you see nothing. There's actually no difference between public and private in the willingness to pay at all, right? The, the variable of interest is the, is the max willingness to pay, yeah? Um, so we don't know what's going on. If, you, if, you know, if individuals were actually engaging in status-seeking behavior, we should see that, that if a public bidding will allows you to sort of bid higher, nothing, right? So then we go and create this dev norm variable and we look at what happens to this dev norm function under public and private bidding and you see that in public bidding it moves to the left. So much closer to zero, it's much more centered on zero. So what's going on essentially is that in the public, uh, uh, when, when bidding is public, people are actually reducing their bids to bring them more in line with what they thought was the social norm, right? So it's more conforming behavior than status-seeking behavior, right? And all of this thing is happening, if you look at the distribution, right around the range where people's own, own bids were a little bit higher than the norm, right? So they're adjusting down, actually. So now when you separate that out and you look at it, you see in the first row that all of these negative bids are actually just in that domain, in the third, fourth, and fifth quintile, yeah? Um, so basically, as I said, they're narrowing their, the difference between their own bids and their beliefs regarding the average bid, right? So what we're interested in now in exploring is whether these, um, well, this is just reconfirming this. If you look at this, you look at the, the probability of the maximum willingness to pay declines if your bid is higher than the normal, right? And the odds of it being right at the norm increase in public bidding, right? So that's consistent with, with, with what, what we're finding, okay. So now we're more interested in looking at exactly what happens among men and women and wh whether differences are, are, whether there's any difference by inclusion, the inclusion treatment that's underlying that and also by the externality treatment. We would expect that if people are told that their actions affect the health of others, they would be much more willing in general to raise their bids, yeah? And, and basically what we find is that the negative impact of conformity is largely being driven <laughs> by villages where this externality priming was not done, right? So where the externality priming is done, which is the third, right, you actually see a small increase in bits, and those differences are significant, generally at the 5%, 6%, five, between five and 10% level, right? So every time, of course, we want to look at these different things, we lose some power, but I think that's pretty clear. Um, so, so externality seems to, encourage more pro-social behavior, which, which is, is, is reasonable, it should, yeah? Um, then we look at women, and here it's interesting. So the trend towards conformity, first of all, appears to be stronger among women, right? So interestingly, women bid higher than men. This is not the case in many kind of public goods game, but in this, when you're selling, sort of looking at willingness to pay for a health, preventive health product, 
women actually bit, bit significantly higher than men, but they're also more conforming, right? And unfortunately, they also have, on average, a poorer norm. They think people would be less willing to pay, pay or they would be willing to pay lower amounts, right? So, so they generally have a lower norm and they are more conforming. And, and so some of this effect that we are seeing is coming from women pulling back, right? Um, you can look at that more clearly here. So you look at it that if your max willingness to pay was greater than the bid norm, it is women who are adjusting down, not men. And the odds of, of your, your max willingness being exactly the bid norm, that increases for women, not for men. Right? So that effect is coming mainly from women who initially bid more, who are more likely to want the product, but then tend to be much more conforming and have essentially lower norms. So that two together um, uh, essentially decrease uh, bids and, and willingness to purchase. Um, now, the, I'm going to skip this actually because this, I think these results are too early. Uh, we want to say something about inclusion villages. So these, remember I told you, underlying all of this treatment, some villages were, were ten, six years ago, were given, were, were required to have formed women's organizations, at least 40% of the VO and COs had to be women. So we want to see whether these six years of empowerment has made inclusion villages act differently uh, than, than others, right? So we in fact do see that bids are actually significantly higher in inclusion villages, right? And the, this tendency to reduce bids in public is actually only appearing among people who were very high. So people whose bids were really much higher than the norm. They are pulling back, but right around the distribution, we see no action, right? So in general, bids are higher, and there's very little. Uh, so the pulling back is little, and to the extent that it's there, is in the, in the, in the higher domain, right, of the distribution. So you can look at this here more clearly, I guess, which is again the same thing we did before. And you can see that basically you have the uh, people are pulling back uh, when they have uh, matching greater than the bid norm, right? But this is coming only from people who are in the 70th, 80th, 90th desa, uh, quantiles, right? Uh, this, so, 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 okay. So I'm going to basically try and summarize what I've just said on the image game. It's a lot of information, um, right? So. So essentially, I think the big takeaways are people generally tend to conform to how they think others will behave when their actions are public. Okay? So you know, the, the lesson from here is it's all very well to try behavioral nudges, right? but you need to know a little bit about what the norms are and how people will behave. Because if we had just done this, okay, and we had not done any of the other games, we had just tried this image thing, um, the fact that this social norm for this new product is quite low and it's lower among women, right? Would have led to a situation where women were much less likely to purchase the product at the end of the day, right? So, so, so the, the, the lesson is, all right, we want to use behavioral nudges, but in order to use them in a sensible way, we need to understand a little bit about what prevailing social norms are. On the other hand, the message is that social norms can be worked on and community organizations are really good places to try and make this kind of thing public and therefore try to improve the social norm or, 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 or expectations around what others will do, right? Um, so, so I think that's, our, that's really our big takeaway from here. In general, we are, we are very happy that both the externality treatment, which we would expect, and inclusion both encourage, um, uh, both raise the social norm and encourage willingness to pay. So they dampen this effect of conformity in some sense, which is what we want to see. Yeah? OK. Um, so I'm going to go on to, lead, to the second, uh, second, second frame field experiment, which is leadership. Um, and here, basically, I'm going to give you some sense. Somebody says that that really, I think, pin things down a little bit. And if you look here, so this is the mean bid. And you can see that there is really not much difference between leaders and followers in the mean bid, right? So this is, you know, if you just make people leaders, right, you don't see much of a difference in the, in the, in the bits that they're willing to put forward. Um, when people are natural leaders, their bids are higher, right? Um, you can see that that's one, natural leaders mean bid is 119 relative to 110. But when natural leaders are allowed to self-select into leadership, their bids are way higher, right? 
So there's something about the group of natural leaders who actually say, yes, I'm going to self-select into leadership. I'm going to come to the actual results. I'm giving you a preview. Yeah. But this is just something to keep in mind as we go to the results, right? So, so again, if we just look at max willingness to pay across the board on average, there's nothing. Okay? There's no difference between leaders and followers. Let me just remind you of this game. Very quickly, people are either randomized into becoming leaders or followers, or people can self-select into leadership. Right? Those are the two arms. So I'm showing you the result for, for the randomized sample. So now people are randomized into leadership. We see no effect, right? Um, so being a first mover has no impact, right? Uh, if I go to the self-selection sample, on the other hand, when people can self-select into leadership, right? Then the average person that self-selects, right? You look up there, demonstrates no difference. But if you are a natural leader, you anyway have a significantly higher bid, which is encouraging. So all these people we were organizing for six years, right? Uh, whether or not they're leaders in the game, whether or not they're assigned to leadership, they have higher bids. But when they self-select to be leaders, so all of this 11.8, 11, 11 this, this, this effect, if you look down the third row, is all coming from natural leaders who actually self-select into leadership. So this is the subgroup of natural leaders who's, who are really saying, no, I want to play the role of the leader here. Then they have way higher bids right, than everyone else. Okay? So, so that, that's very encouraging. Um, all right. So then let's look at leadership and women, which is also quite in interesting. So, so now we're going to divide up these people so between males. So these regressions are male and female, and we do the same thing again. And you can see that the main effect is coming from women, right? So it is women who are natural leaders and who say, yes, I'm willing to be, uh, be, an, be a leader in this game. Those bids are the highest. It's not coming from men. Right? So we looked before that the average bids were higher for women, but then they were more conforming. So now we are seeing in another game that if, you know, if you're actually going to be triggering leadership, right, then, then women who are natural leaders and say, yes, I'm willing to be a leader, that's where all the action is, right? So they really have much higher bids, yeah? And, and you can see that these actually, these p-values are quite significant, yeah? Okay, so now we look at this by inclusion, right? So these are natural leaders who are randomized uh, to be leaders, right? And, and then they are, and, and we are basically going to look at inclusion and non-inclusion. And here you see that even when they are randomized into leadership, in inclusion villages, even the randomized leaders bid higher, right? We saw no average effect, remember, right? But when we look at it by inclusion villages, even randomized leaders are willing, willing to bid higher. And then here we go to basically we're looking now. So this the prior one that I showed you, as I said, is for the randomized sample. I'm now going to look at this for the self-selection sample, and this is really interesting. So you look at the um, the total size of the increase in the bid is much higher in the self-selection uh, villages, right? So the so in in inclusion villages where people self-select, their bids are just higher. So self-selection in the presence of inclusion, they just have higher bids, right? But, but basically, the major impact here is again coming from the natural leader who self-selects into leadership, yeah? OK, so I'm going to be going very fast across all of this, but I think uh, hopefully you can keep up with some of this. Um, so there's lots going on here. But here is the, um, the results for externalities. Now, again, we triggered externalities. So the way, interesting thing is that this externalities messaging again increases the overall level of bids. We would want that. Across the sample, everybody bids higher when you give them the externality message, right? It also triggers a leadership effect among first movers who are be or leaders who are randomized into leadership. So I've just given you an externality message. You were randomized into leadership. Everybody's bids are higher, but your bid is still higher, right? So, so leaders, so even when randomized, react, which is interesting. Um, but the really interesting thing is that when externality messaging is absent, right, then natural leaders still bid more, right? 
So in other words, natural leaders do not require as much the externalities messaging in order to bid more. They're already more pro-social. But you're triggering pro-sociality among people who are simply randomized into leadership. So these kinds of messages on externalities, your, you know, uh, the actions you take will affect the health of others. Those sorts of nudges are really important in environments where people would otherwise be, be discouraged, right? But in the subgroup of people, who, if you have a very organized village and there are lots of people who are willing to take the lead, right, then they may be, th then even without the externalities message, they may be far more pro-social um, kind of uh, behaviors. So, so th this, this is particularly apparent when you move to the self-selection sample. Um, so here, um, you see that the bids are, the average bid is much higher, right? It's uh, between 101 to 114. So externalities, as I said, raises the average bid here. But here, even though the natural self-selected leader is willing to bid more, almost 22 uh, rupees more, that is not higher than what is happening in the no externalities treatment for the natural leader. So natural leaders actually step in, even in the absence of externalities, right? Again, in the self-select sample. OK, so I guess I'm going to. Um, you know what, I'm, I don't know, how am I doing on time? Yeah, so good. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe this to you. I'm not going to describe the results of the subsidy game, which is super convenient for me because those are at the earliest stage, right? So we will be working on those and, and working them out later. Um, I, I really want to just say one thing about the subsidy only, which I thought was really interesting, which kind of confirms what happens uh, in a lot of lab experiments, which is simply this. If you give the people, if, if you give people the ability to select out of a sharing environment, they generally choose to share, they, they choose to move, more people choose to move to the private bid, and they prove not to share. So there's something about pushing people to be in a sharing environment, even when they know that they can share zero, right? So you've so told people, you're a group that can share, feel free to share zero. It's all private, right? You're a group that can outright self-select into sharing. The people who are placed in a sharing environment, right, tend to be to reduce that, to, to sort of like share more, right, because there's this sense of, um, right, so, so people who opt out, so if you look at this, in the self-selection subsidy, right, uh, people basically have lower bids than in the people who are who are put in a, in a sharing environment, which is interesting. And this is kind of replicates results uh, from lab experiments, right? So it's just something, and I, I, won't, I won't talk more about, about the subsidy treatment, because um, I think I'm, I'm, am I out of time, time, or do I have some time? You still have three minutes. Okay, I can tell you just a little bit more, and, and I can stop. So again, um, these results, of course, this decline in, in the probability of sharing you can see up there is very substantial. Um, what is interesting here is that when you look at externalities, right, and this is something we, are, we, are, we, are, um, we, we find very interesting. So among women, being given this externality exposure to the fact that you know, it could affect the health of others, it reduces the propensity to share when women are randomized into sharing, right? So when you're put in a sharing environment, you are less likely to share. And we were quite concerned about this. It's sort of an interesting result. We know women have lower norms about what others will do, what others would be willing to buy. And so we're wondering whether, and we're really actually looking at, at this result more closely, is one of the things could be that, that women, when exposed to, to this messaging, think, oh, it's really urgent that I do something, and they want to buy the product. So they're basically retaining, the attempt is to retain the subsidy for themselves, right, and not to share. And particularly, you would be encouraged to do that if you already had really poor priors about the fact that other people will take it up, <coughs> right? So your subsidy goes to, actually, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a dead loss, right? If you're willing to share and the other person doesn't purchase, that subsidy is lost to you. So if you have very low priors about others, you'd want to retain the subsidy and make purchase decisions. But we, we, I think we can, we can work this out by looking at actual purchase decisions. Um, uh, in the sample, we have not done that, but I thought that was quite interesting. I'm, I'm actually going to stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Gazala.